the ever-changing and intriguing treatments for a terrible disease, breast cancer and precision oncology. Tonight, On Call with the Prairie Doc. Starting this season, we are offering a Facebook Live option for our viewers to still be able to watch the show during the regular broadcast times on Thursday nights and ask questions. All you need is either your laptop, tablet, or a mobile device, such as your smartphone, to view the show. Here's how to do that. First, log into your Facebook account. If you don't have a Facebook account, go to Facebook.com and complete the information to create an account. In the search bar, type in Prairie Doc. Make sure to click like on our Facebook page so you can get updates and notified when we are going live. Each Thursday on the Prairie Docs page, you will be able to see a live broadcast of the newest episode. You can also ask Dr. Holm questions via Facebook Live. All you have to do is ask your question in the comment bar and await a response. If you miss a show live on Facebook, it will be available later both on the Prairie Doc Facebook site or at prairiedoc.org. I'm yours. Good evening and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc. According to the National Cancer, Cancer Institute, the number of new cases for cancer is about 450 per 100,000 men and women per year. The number of people living beyond a cancer diagnosis reached nearly 14.5 million in 2014 and is expected to rise to almost 19 million by 2024. This evening, we will visit the front lines of medicine versus cancer in this age-old battle. First, let's take a look at this week's Prairie Dot Quiz question. Choose the best answer. Breast cancer risk decreases in a woman's life who has in her lifetime, one, been sedentary, two, been a regular runner. It decreases in which group? Choose the best answer. The viewers who call in the correct answer will be entered into a drawing to win a signed copy of our book, The Picture of Health. Each of my essays, originally written for this show, comes with a wonderful accompanying photograph by Dr. Judith Peterson. We'll announce the answer and the winner at the end of the show. Remember, you only have 10 minutes to get your answer in. We answer your medical questions about cancer as they are called in or sent to us via Facebook or email the whole hour. So call in your questions to 1-888-376-6225. Or send us an email to the address on the screen. Joining us tonight is good friend, longtime good friend, Dr. Julie Ryland with Avera Medical Group Comprehensive Breast Care in Sioux Falls. Thank you for joining us, Julie. Thanks for having me. That's great. So, he, a real surgeon. I mean, that's, you know, we were talking to our students before the show about surgeon. your surgery experiences. I mean, it's a, it has been, when you went in, a kind of a man's world. You kind of broke. Well, there were some people that broke before me, so definitely, but yes, there were, I was one of a few women at the time, 18 years ago, when I finished residency. Yeah. And so uh, you did general surgery for a number of years, yes. and then you kind of migrated into breast surgery, for, for example. Correct. So for eight years, I worked with a group uh, down in Sioux Falls, and I was part of that partnership. We did general surgery. but. Because I was the only female in the group, I had a lot of women that wanted a female surgeon for their breast cancer care. And as they became more and more patients, I found that I just love that patient population. And, mm. and it really spoke to me, and it became my life work. And, and um, I remember hearing grumbling from the rest of the surgeons when they, you were off the call schedule. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. It very changed true. your life, but you're still on call. I'm yes. sure. Yeah, but there aren't any emergencies. I mean, there are very few breast cancer emergencies. So, right. so the the lifestyle is much better. Right. Um, but it's a different kind of work altogether. Uh, breast cancer surgery and and taking care of women with breast cancer is not that intense surgical crisis one after another. You know, right. it, it, we have time to think about it. We have time to make good decisions, um, to gather all of our information. So. Well, and tell me how it's changed in the last uh, 20 years. Uh, I mean, I know that when you were in your training, it was one thing. Right. And we could do some things. It would, you know, some people would get off scot-free, 
cured, hallelujah. Some would have breast cancer that was still there, but we treated it with chemo, mm -hmm. and people lived with it for a long period of time sometimes. Some people just don't live with right. it long. Time. Right. Has it changed much? Yes, very the much. prognosis, like, can you give me numbers for prognosis? Oh, pro well, I know that we are finding breast cancers at a much earlier stage in the United States because of our great screening with mammography. Mammography saves lives, we know that. So we're finding anyone, a woman with a stage one, stage two, which are the smallest breast cancers, has about a 95 to 98% five year survival. That's, that's amazing. 98%. Yes, yes. So those are really, really great numbers. Um, we know that for the more aggressive breast cancers, we would much rather give those women chemotherapy before we operate on them. And that is completely different than what we were doing in so, the 80s and 90s. pre-surgery chemo. Neoadjuvant is what we call it. Right. And they're doing that for pancreatic cancer too, mm -hmm. I might add. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there's a reason for it. If you take the cancer out and throw it in a bucket, you have no idea what the chemo is going to do to it because it's gone. And so you give the chemo hoping that it's the right combination and it's doing the right job targeting the cells. But if you leave the cancer in place and give the chemo, that gives you an opportunity to watch real time that cancer shrink. And then you know, hey, you either got a complete response and, and, and that is gone. It's almost gone. And that's a very good predictor for how you're going to do. If you don't have a complete response, at Avera, what we're doing is we're taking the, the residual or the leftover cancer cells and we're retesting them. Why didn't they shrink? Why aren't they gone? Is there another drug we should be using to destroy these rest of these, these right, cells? Right, right, right. So that's a, a, a huge thing. Yes. A real change. Now, are they doing it in every kind of cancer surgery? Not necessarily. I mean, there are some that they still want to do the surgery first because you still have to get your information. But when they see the maybe more advanced cancers, they'll want to do chemo first. Right. You have stage four cancer. There's a lot of people who have stage four cancer. It's spread already. Right. It's, it's now metastatic to lung or mm -hmm. brain or bone. So it's outside the box. Right, right. And... So they commonly just, the only thing that we know will make a difference. Surgery is not going to benefit. It's not an option anymore. So we're going to try chemo. Mm -hmm. We may ra do radiation to spot weld. Uh, and now we have some new advancements, don't we? Right. And that's where we talk about the precision medicine. So now that's a whole thing. Explain precision medicine. I hope I can. Me. Remember, I'm a surgeon. Yes. <laughs> So what they do is they look at the genetic makeup of the cancer cells, not of the person themselves, but of the cancer cells. And they look at how those cancer cells make new cells and what is the process. And they look at the different chemical reactions uh, that go along with that. And that's where they find out where they can interrupt that process. So this drug will interrupt at this point and this drug will interrupt at this point and you can stop those cells from making new cells or for directing more cells to make new cells. So it's, it's where you find out exactly that cancer, not any old cancer. So what we used to do is you have breast cancer, you have lung cancer, you have pan pancreatic cancer. These drugs typically work. And so we give everybody the, the same typical, drugs. The typically work. Throw the spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks. Yeah. Now we're able to look at everybody's individual cells figure out what makes them special and unique, and then decide what the best drug is for that individual. And, and we're really on the beginning stages yes. of that. I mean, don't you think that eventually we'll be able to look at that single cell or, and do the particular test and know, wow, this is gonna to respond to yes. A or B or C. Yes, exactly, and that's what we're doing. And that's what's so exciting, and we're one of the few places in the country that's doing it. So that's right. even better. I, I, when I go, I lecture around the country, and when I tell people that we're doing this, they're, they're we're not doing that here. And they're much bigger cities than we have, and yeah. that's pretty cool. Now, I know immunotherapy, we <clears throat> don't, we aren't the only ones that have immunotherapy. No, we're not. No, they're, they're, they're doing that. Doing, they're, they're, but we a are lot doing of people that. are doing immunotherapy. Yes, it is another new way of looking at how are we going to treat these cancer cells, and how are we going to stop them. So it's separate from that From the precision, precision medicine. stuff. Yep. Okay. Well, knowing the genetics of a patient can help in treating many ailments. Cancer treatments have gained a dramatic increase in effectiveness due to advances in these forms of treatments.
between 1950 and 1990, breast cancer mortality increased 4% per year. It reached a peak in 1991. Over the past 21 years, the mortality has declined 23%. So now there is not anyone in the world that quotes a cure rate less than 80% for breast cancer. Everyone believes at least every four out of five women with breast cancer are cured. So you have to look at rate of change in the world and take this in a broader perspective. So people look at what's known as knowledge doubling. So if you look at cancer, first chemotherapies were 1943, applied to children with the disease. When I went through medical school, it was not known what caused cancer. Then it was found out that it was alterations in the genes in the body, which was responsible for cancer. So the first genes were sequenced in the early 1980s. First targeted therapy was 1998. First sequencing of the genome was 2001. First immunotherapies were 2011. I just looked at a partial listing of FDA-approved targeted therapies. At the moment, there are at least 84. In five years, it is expected that there will be at least 50 immunotherapies. All a patient basically has to do is hang on, and this disease will be cured. You know, it was fall of 2015, I started having some symptoms, and it was a a really good year for me and my family. Otherwise, uh, uh, my wife and I, we, uh, we had a daughter that summer, so I was a new father. And then as it continued to not get better, and they're like, oh, just give it time, uh, eventually I insisted on, on an MRI. And when they did the MRI, I got one of those phone calls that nobody ever wants to get where, where they said, you know, are you sitting down in your back? That, that's cancer, and it's spreading from somewhere else. So they're like, this is a very big deal. You need to see someone right away. You know, when I first um, found out about this and I, I went in for diagnosis, you know, it was, it was pretty grim. And I, they told me I had uh, bile duct cancer, which is bad enough, but then they said it was stage four, which is really bad. And uh, yeah, it was, it was not a great start on this journey, for sure. <laughs> but we sequenced his tumor and we've sequenced his blood and he had two, three obvious alterations. So we gave a combination of one chemotherapy and one targeted agent and one immunotherapy. And then we just gave that treatment over a period of time and we watched the cancer cells in his blood progressively decline and he has done phenomenally well. If there is one message here if your doctor has not sequenced you, either ask him or her to sequence or find another doctor, because this is going to be the key to treating cancer in the future. Well, this is your show, and your questions are key to our show discussion, so please call in your questions about cancer of any kind, cancer of the breast, and uh, call them to 1-888-376-6225, or send us an email to ask at prairiedoc.org, and Julie and I will try to answer those questions as best we can. We really would like your questions, please. It's your show. So. Um, you were talking about uh, neoadjuvant, and we, we just talked about precision and sequencing of mm -hmm. genetics. Um, let's talk about oncoplasty. Oh, thank I you. I mean, see, breast, <laughs> breast surgeon, this is your bailiwick. Yes, right? yes. So oncoplasty, meaning cancer plastic surgery. Right, right. Explain that. So uh, when, we, when we do breast cancer surgery, typically the surgeon just makes an incision over where the cancer is, takes out that breast cancer, closes up the incision, and leaves a hole there, essentially, a space. And a dimple that's going to be there. Well, when you give radiation, then the skin dumps or flattens down along the chest wall, and that cr creates a terrible deformity of the breast. Oncoplastic surgery is, is just a mindset of how do we think about that breast? 
what kind of incisions can we make where we can hide where the incisions are? What can we do to this breast to make it maybe perkier? Get rid of some extra skin so that when we remove the breast tissue and we remove the skin envelope, make it smaller, that breast is gonna fit better and we're not gonna get a dimple, we're not gonna get a pucker. And so you use plastic surgery techniques to take out the cancer. But oncoplasty is cancer and plastic surgery. So cancer always comes first. Cancer right, is right, the right. most important. Right. So uh, my thought is that oftentimes uh, if you're going to reduce the tissue in that breast, it's going to be smaller. So do you add tissue? Well, when uh, for a lot of women, as especially as we get older, our breasts start to droop. You still have the same amount of tissue, but you have your your skin is stretched out. If I can reduce that skin envelope, take some of that extra skin away, then I that lifts up the breast and it gives the appearance that it's more full. And so the breast size stays pretty much the same. So what about that other the other breast? I mean. Yep, you can go to the other side and do the same procedure to make them look equal. And insurance pays for that because that's an equalization procedure for a cancer operation. Okay, so they, they that and they always pay for that? Mostly we, we make sure that they do before we take it to surgery, yeah. for sure, but Medicare actually sends my patients who are Medicare age a letter telling them that they are, they, they deserve this and that if they'd like to have an equalization procedure, they can ask that. Oh, I've already done it. So I, always, I tell my patients, you know, I can do it at the same time. A lot of them will, will take that okay. offer. So um, now the, the other thing that I, I keep thinking about is a patient, a patient, a friend of mine, a dear friend who had breast cancer and both breasts removed. And so she was without breasts. Mm -hmm. And subsequently she had uh, artificial breast tissue implanted. Okay. to give her back breasts. Mm -hmm. Reconstruction. Yeah, so explain that. So for a woman who chooses to remove her breast tissue, and, and in my practice, I always tell my patients about 85% of those women who have breast cancer are safe to keep their breasts. Right. It, there's it no used difference. to be the other way. Boy, they it, were doing total yeah, mastectomy. I know. There's no difference in survival whether you keep your breasts or you remove them in 85% of the cases. Then we have those women who have a genetic defect or who have breast cancer in multiple areas of one breast where that's just not safe. It's not a good idea. Right. And so those women would have to, would, we would really want them to have a mastectomy. So today what we do is if a woman is a smaller breast, we actually make incisions underneath the breast we take out the entire breast from that incision and then the plastic surgeon comes in and he puts an implant in right away. That's called a nipple sparing mastectomy direct to implant. So the, the implant's put in right away. If that woman wants to be bigger or we need to make it bigger because they're smaller to begin with, we need to stretch out that muscle, they'll put the implant or a, a, what's called a tissue expander, which I tell everybody it's like a balloon with a nozzle and they put that underneath the muscle and then over time they add more fluid that stretches out the muscle and that it creates that look of a breast. Right. And then when that's stretched out enough, the plastic surgeon takes out that tissue expander and replaces it with an implant. But then you get to preserve your nipple, your skin looks just the same, you just have incisions under here. Right. Now you lose nipple sensation, but you get the appearance that you're the same as you were before. Right. What about uh, <clears throat> when nipples have to go? You can do tattoos. Oh, and absolutely, stuff like that. yes. There are some amazing tattoo artists we have. There's one in Watertown. We have a couple in, in Sioux Falls. I have um, some patients who've actually gone to Baltimore to a famous tattoo artist. And they're three dimensional tattoos. They're absolutely stunning. It's, mm -hmm. I look at them and I go, wow, I can't believe that's not right. three dimensional. Right. And there's sometimes that no matter what, I mean, it's spread enough that you, you don't have tissue to re preserve. That's pretty rare. So when we get somebody who has um, a neglected breast cancer, where now it's coming out on the skin, right. what we'd want to do is give that woman chemotherapy, shrink it, get it to go down, get it to, to really regress so that when we do a mastectomy, we can get those edges closed. What percentage of, of women will... Uh, have a cancer that responds to chemotherapy? Oh, that's a tough question. Um, in my practice and what we do at Avera, I would say that, oh gosh, in the past two years, I've maybe had one patient who did not. Who, one, who, one out one of how many out years? Of, 
we see about 150. Um, not all of them get neoadjuvant chemotherapy. I'd say about 75 to 80 percent of the women who get neoadjuvant, maybe 90 percent, who get neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Which means before the surgery. Right. Before surgery, we are seeing a noticeable difference in their breasts. And a lot of times they tell me it's, it was after their first dose of chemo. It's like it started shrinking right away. And yeah. that's really reassuring. Yeah. Well, we, you know, <clears throat> uh, this, but the chemo is not always fun, I would say. Oh, I wouldn't, I, would, I would agree with you. Nobody wants to do, nobody's jumping up and down to get chemotherapy. No, they aren't, are they? <laughs> no, and you know, in my world, we surgeons always think that we save lives. Yes. And so what I tell my patients now is breast surgery, all they do is they get rid of the breast cancer that's in the breast, and that doesn't save anybody's life. Chemotherapy can save a life. Say that again. I want to hear that again because people think otherwise. I want to right. hear that from a doctor who takes care of people who have seen <laughs> okay. it through the years. Yes. What was that again though? Chemotherapy can save life. So breast cancer that's in the breast is you can operate on it and remove it and you can give radiation and you can keep it under control in the breast. But you cannot control what those cells do when they go to other parts of the body. The only thing that can go after those cells is chemotherapy. And it's a lot better now than it used to oh, be. Oh yes, absolutely. Now people are losing their hair and they're doing ice mm -hmm. things on their yep, head. Yep, cold caps. That. Explain uh, that. So cold caps is freezing those hair follicles so that when the chemotherapy is going through, the hair follicles are not getting the chemotherapy mm -hmm. and it preserves the hair. And it's been working. And does it really work? I mean, does yes, it Yes, I'm amazed. I, I, people ask me as I was getting chemo whether I should, had the cold therapy. I didn't have the cold therapy. My hair got pretty thin, mm -hmm. but it came back. Yeah, and it does. Uh, we have some questions. Okay. Thank you for the questions. <laughs> Call in some more. How do you get rid of neuropathy after cancer oh. treatment? Oh, gabapentin is a drug that's being used to get rid of neuropathy. <clears throat> it is very challenging, and that is a tough one. Um, I know that they are doing some things with uh, maybe acupuncture may help, mm -hmm. but it is it is a tough one. And usually right. when the neuropathy starts, that's an indication that the medical the, oncologist will start backing off on right. the chemotherapy. Well, as one who took cisplatin, mm -hmm. which is a heavy metal chemotherapy, which gave me neuropathy, I started getting the neuropathy. And they I called my oncologist. He backed the dose down. Yeah. And, you yeah. know, I still have some ringing. I still have some numbness in my feet. But I'm, I'm out now from chemo <clears throat> eight or nine months, and I'm getting feeling back. Yeah. You know, it, you get some back if you don't go too far. Right. And that's, and that's why when she said or asked how do you get rid of it, I don't think anybody has a good answer for no. that, which is why we back off at the chemo. We right. don't want to go down that road. The, the word neuropathy is nerve... <laughs> Uh, loss, yes, and it really it means you know peripheral neuropathy is numbness, tingling uh, in your toes and your fingers, and uh, those kinds of things. If you if you start to get it in your toes and your fingers and you feel it's ascending, it's going up, you know that's you worry that it's going to be hit the big nerve, which is the noodle, and you want that's a that's a medical word, you know. Yes, yes, me. noodle. Mm -hmm. I use uh, it all the time. I do it too. <laughs> A woman from Sioux Falls <laughs> wants to express the need for annual mammograms. Caller was diagnosed with breast cancer and was amazed how well the team of doctors was able to treat her. So let's talk about mammograms. There's been a change in the mm -hmm. recommendations. It used to be every year, now it's every other year. It used to be at 40, now it's at 50, unless there's an early cancer in your family or a BRCA gene. Um, and uh, and you said it earlier, mammograms save yes. lives, but it also can cause unneeded surgery in some cases. So explain that, because there's a lot of controversy on this. <clears throat> yes, thing. yes, very much so. And I think that the epidemiologists, the people who study the t statistics, are the ones that are coming out with, wait a minute, this may not benefit them benefit women between 40 and 50. But those of us in the trenches taking care of women between 40 and 50 who come in with their breast cancers, we're like, uh, this would never have been found uh, without a mammogram. So it's really hard for us working with this every day to agree with no mammograms before the age of 50. I'll come back, I'll, I'll come back with the, when they came out with the comment that uh, the epidemiologist said Self breast exam oh. is not needed, and <clears throat> the exam of the breast in the office is doesn't save lives and doesn't make a difference. Some of that has to do with the fact that 
uh, it's it's over a thousand million people, right? And uh, some of it doesn't matter, but a lot of it does. When you have a patient come into your office and say to you, "Doctor Holm, I found a lump in my breast when I was examining. What do you think I should do?" And indeed, it's cancer. And, and I mean, you know, that it. I, I go, "There's one," right? And there's been a lot more than that in my experience. So I think. There's some things that you listen to and you go, that's an epidemiological way of looking at things. That's not a real in the trenches right. way of looking. And what we're recommending, and certainly I recommend 40 and over, um, but if somebody wants to go every other year, if there's not a lot of family history, but you know, 15% of women who have breast cancer have a family history. 85% don't. So, so breast cancer pops up. And let me just say that in a different way. 85% of the breast cancers that are discovered didn't have a family history. Correct. So that, you know, family history is it's an random. issue, of course. But uh, it's a random deal in people who have no reason. Now, here's another question that I have, and I, I want to... So people say to me, well, Rick, you, you came down with uh, pancreatic cancer. Why did that happen? What, who's to blame? No what one. Is the blame <laughs> for that? Yeah, it, I think it's human nature to have to want a reason. Yes, and, we and, do and, want and a I, reason. And I certainly I have patients who come in and they're beating themselves up because they took hormonal therapy for a while or they did this and they. I said stop. Nobody really knows and and don't do that because there's nothing you can do about it anyway. Now yeah. let's let's deal with the problem at hand and move forward. Quit wasting energy on beating yourself up for one thing or another. We don't know. So I had a dear friend who died of breast cancer who had, uh, came to me before the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. She was my patient. Mary Helen? No, it was oh. another lady. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was a nurse. And she said, um, I can't get off estrogen therapy. Oh. I'm really worried. And I said, you know, the numbers are like this. 28, uh, or something like 20 in 10,000, if you don't take it, 28 in 10,000. It's that eight out of 28 in 10,000, now you decide yourself, it's your decision. Right. Uh, th those are the numbers that uh, I, I would say that they are inflated by people who are pushing certain things. But the long and the short of it is, it wasn't the estrogen. Really, was well, it? what I tell women is, it didn't start the breast cancer. But certainly, if your cancer is estrogen fed, it allowed it to have plenty of nutrients to make new cells. So, but it did not start the process. Yeah. We have another question. Is immunotherapy a protocol used for ductal pancreatic cancer? That's a very interesting question. Is immunotherapy a protocol used for ductal pancreatic cancer? Uh, and I think that it is, but it's not uh, uh, stage 2B like mine is. Mm -hmm. It's stage 4. Right. And that's because what we're doing when we have something that's new, we start with the patients who are metastatic. Those are, the, those are the patients that are not going to survive. And if we can otherwise. get them, right, otherwise, sorry, if we can get them to yeah, have so a longer life, spread. spread everywhere. Yeah. So once it's, once it's stage out of the four, box. it's out of the box. And those people, what our job is then is how long can we get them to live well with their cancer? Right. And it's to stay that step ahead. So immunotherapy is used to see is this going to be another thing that we can use to keep those cancer cells at bay? And now we're finding certain just almost uh, amazing magical re responses, not only to uh, the, the precision type of thing, but to the immunotherapy. Mm -hmm. I mean, people who had widely metastatic cancer goes away. It's uh, very impressive I've what been they're watched, finding. I've been watching it and, and certain friends and patients and, you know, my gosh, Unbelievable changes happening right yeah. now. Um, maybe someday I'll be out of a job. <laughs> Would, but that then maybe you'd be retired. Yeah, it, it I'm would, fine but it's going to be many years before we're going to get there, Jill. It's know. many years. Uh, we have a, a caller had a reverse shoulder surgery in May, and the area under her arm is still tender. When do you believe she should have her next mammogram? That's a good question. Reverse shoulder, okay, it would probably depend upon how well she can raise that arm over her head because when we put that in the, in the machine, you have to be able to hold on to this, this bar. bar. 
I've had a few mammograms. Uh, <laughs> yes, there you go. You know what it's I know like. How to I've do had this. none. I've never I, had right. None. No. Uh, so if she can do that comfortably, and then get her, you know, you practice at home. Put your arm up, and can you can you move that shoulder in? Uh, but you could also ask your orthopedic surgeon. You know, when can I get a mammogram? Because he probably knows what that in involves too, and may have some recommendations for that. You also know that whenever you have surgery in an area, there are going to be lymph nodes. Mm -hmm. that are inflammatory because mm -hmm. the body's there healing it. Right. So if you're feeling lumps and bumps in there, uh, you know, of course you can, you, you, you always worry that it might be something else, but very likely the lumps and bumps that are in the uh, armpit uh, under the shoulder that just had surgery is mm -hmm. not breast cancer. It's inflammatory normal response to a healing mm -hmm. shoulder surgery. Would you agree? I would agree. Okay. If you are diagnosed with cancer, it is important for you to know that there are resources beyond your doctor's office. There is a wonderful infrastructure designed to assist in all aspects of your life with the disease. The Navigation Center is very exciting because it's a free community service. So really here to serve all of the Avera footprint across the entire state of South Dakota and into neighboring states. Mm -hmm. The Navigation Center is 24-7, uh, and so it doesn't matter time of day, day of week, somebody will answer the phone line. And we have uh, both the oncology nurses and social workers who are available to talk to patients immediately or in follow-up and not even patients, it can be any community members. We also have the ability to email. We do video visits actually, so on the Avera Now platform, people can reach out and have a virtual visit face-to-face -face with either the nurse or social work navigator. One individual called me back two days later, later and said that's just phenomenal what they did for me. He had moved back from another community further away and needed care and did not know where to go and he was hurting and needed help. So, uh, you know, he said it was just fantastic and you can't be commended enough for what you're doing up there. Cancer is something that affects nearly everyone. So if you don't have cancer yourself, you know someone in your life who has been impacted. And so if you can have somebody that you can reach out to that can provide you that support or be that trusted resource or hub of information, we feel like it's making a big impact on the communities. So if somebody is experiencing something and they've never experienced it before, or you hear something like you have cancer, it's an emotional emergency. It's not always a medical emergency. I think number one, they're gonna find comfort. Uh, I think that's the first thing because you're devastated at that point in time and you need, you need that comfort, those kind words. And after you've found that, uh, they'll move you forward or get you in contact with the caregiver, uh, whoever that may be. I think it's important that you don't have to wait when you're in that, that feeling of fear that you have a number you can call, that you have people you can turn to that live and breathe oncology every day that can guide you through what to expect. Welcome back, thank you for questions. We'd ask for more questions. These are very much appreciated. Uh, we were talking about uh, situations where a person has spread of cancer or has known cancer or so someone who is high risk, for example, let's okay. say BRCA1 or 2 mm -hmm. or lots of family history of cancer. Uh, and there's been some question about doing blood tests for yeah. screening for yeah. cancer. So uh, when you have different risks, some of those risks are you've maybe had a biopsy that was had abnormal tissue and that abnormal tissue is more likely to become cancer later on. So when we do a mammogram and we see an abnormality, we can sometimes we'll say, well, we're not sure if you should have a biopsy. We don't know if it's gone that far, if it's if it's that necessary. We have a new <clears throat> thing where we can do a blood test. That blood test searches for certain proteins in the blood that would indicate that there may be a cancerous process going on in that breast. And so if the high if you have a high protein reading, then a breast biopsy would be indicated. If you have a low protein reading, then we can wait and say, okay, right. let's watch this. So it isn't one of <laughs> those screening a normal person for cancer but yeah. it is one of those deals where you're gonna go okay do we do something right. or not it's kind of hard to know test this normal let's give it some time right high in protein 
let's, let's move forward a, to a little bit more aggressive therapy. Exactly. It's called what? Vedasa blood test okay. for breast for breast mammographic abnormalities. Right. Okay. A caller had um, um, uh, from Sioux Falls asked, "Why does breast cancer seem to the?" cancer that gets the most attention. Why does breast cancer seem to get the most attention? What, what is, why exactly is why it so talked about? Why is it, I mean, prostate cancer, one of the students said, I know, prostate I know. cancer, breast cancer, you know, it just, it's but the breast cancer favorite. has all of the attention, all the money. It's everybody's favorite. I think it's because it's politically correct. It's a woman's disease that identifies her as a woman. When you think about what are the two things that let you know that that person walking down the street is a woman, is it's her hair is longer and she has breasts. And so it's, a, it's an immediate gender identifier. identifier. Okay. Yes, it is. Um, when Betty Ford was the first one to actually talk about breast cancer in public, and she was the first one, because she had breast cancer, yeah. and after that, it became something that we could talk about. But before then, no one even oh. mentioned the word. So to me, it's, it's, it's gained in popularity for sure. And because 50% of our population is, is women, women are the nurturers, breasts are nurturing. There's just so much culturally that ties, that gets tied up in our breasts. So having a disease of your breast is very threatening to a lot of women and their identity as a woman. So did you know that uh, of all the animals in the world uh, that uh, humans are the only uh, animal that seems to do sexual activity front to front. Oh. And that the, the, the breast in a human, is woman, it? is the only breast that doesn't go away after childbirth, that stays there. As a, as, as a sexual function, yes. And, and, and when we talk about, when I talk about that with my patients who have breast cancer, we talk about their surgery, we t I actually talk about their breast as a sexual organ. So we keep that in mind because we want these women after their breast cancer treatment to go back to being sexual beings. Yes. You know, and that's really important for part, your, for part your of whole your image, life. Your yes. sense of what you are. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Some anthropologists have suggested that that frontal face-to-face -face interaction that humanity has been doing these how many thousands of years that hum humans have been on this earth made the man who is brusque and mean and warlike have to talk with his partner who is loving and caring and a motherly person that takes care of children and wants that to be there are other children in the world and brought us to be civilized <laughs> and that we can blame the breast yeah there you go there you go <laughs> i uh, but, myself i'm not trying to blame the breast but and uh, i'm not about to suggest that we would take the money that is raised for breast cancer and give it to others we should just raise the, the raise awareness the of these other, other breast cancers yeah. other cancers other cancers yep um call her mom and sister both had breast cancer, smoked, and had hormone replacement therapy. Okay, now is smoking a risk factor for breast cancer? Yes, it is. The caller is wondering if she is still at high risk for cancer and if she should receive hormonal replacement therapy if she has never had cancer. Okay, so what we would do in a situation like that is bring her in and look at, we actually have several computerized models that looks at family history, plugs in those numbers, and comes up with another number to tell us what those risks are. And if the risks are greater than 20%, that woman is considered to be high risk. So you, and that's because of your family history. So it's what? Brothers, and, I mean sisters, sisters with cancer? So a, a really easy way to do it is you get 6% increased risk for every first degree relative. First degree meaning first brother, degree. sister, mother, father, son, yes. daughter, With, son. Right. So if it's her mother and her sister, that's 12% plus 12% already, she's at 24%. That's over the 20% threshold. So that woman would probably be, if we ran the computer model, which I'm doing it easy, right, this right, 6%. Right. If we ran the computer model, we'd probably get something over 20%. So then we say, okay, you can't help the fact that you have a mother and a sister with, that's genetic. You, you, right. you can't do Nobody's anything about that. Nobody's to blame. But you can do other things to help yourself and to reduce your risks. One of them is to quit smoking. That's definitely a risk factor for breast cancer. Another is to exercise more. We know that women who exercise 30 minutes a day, five days a week, can reduce their risk for breast cancer by up to 20%. 
women. You would think that the bouncing and all that stuff would put inflammation and put people at risk. Not at all. No, 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 no. Because we're what we're doing is we're getting rid of those extra calories. We're using them up. We're putting them towards muscle. So any that activity is definitely good for us. I mean, you know, it is good for a whole a host of different yes. kinds of cancers, yes. let alone heart disease. And, and walking is also supposed to improve your risk of having Alzheimer's disease. Did you yes. know that? Yes, well, absolutely. So, so there's so many benefits to walking. <laughs> Another thing we need to do is we need to keep our weight under control. And in the United States, we have a huge problem with obesity. In the world. It's in a the world. world. It, there are now more people in the world that are overweight than are underweight. It, and that is a tragedy. So we know that there are 13 different cancers that are associated with being obese or overweight. And breast cancer is one of them. So I tell all of my patients if they're overweight, okay, crisis is over. Your, your breast cancer has been treated. Now you have to take control. Right. You, you are the one that's putting food in your mouth, and this is something you can t control. Well, my, my personal, and I'm gonna turn it around, disagree a little in as much as, everything that you said is correct, except to say that our, our success in getting people to actually lose weight and keep it off is so poor. And the recidivism, as they say, the regaining of weight, even if they lose weight by taking weird diets or mm -hmm. supplements or whatever it is that you're doing, uh, and so I think that it's right to go them in that direction. I think there's a lot to be said for eating less. Oh. But I think that should be your goal. Eating less, exercising more, but, ignore, but don't let the scale stop you from eating less and exercising more. Don't I look see. at the scale. That's your, not your goal. Your right. goal is to eat less and, and exercise more. And get rid of those carbohydrates because the carbohydrates are too many sugars. Today, Americans, okay, in, two, in 1900, I agree with you. Americans ate five pounds of sugar a year. Today, we consume 120 pounds of sugar in a year. High fructose corn syrup is added to everything. It's a preservative for heaven's sakes. Yes. We don't need it. Yes. And so that sugar has actually been shown to lead us down that pathway of inflammation, which changes the cells right. and take them on that pathway to cancer. I, I think about those 120 pounds of sugar and I'm not eating my share. So <laughs> somebody else is taking more I'm than not I'm either. Me. I'm not either. <laughs> so um, so <clears throat> the, 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 the issue I have, you know, and you've talked about diet, uh, there, is, there are people who talk about supplements. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And there are people who go to Mexico for uh, unusual therapies. And there are even people in the United States who tout to have answers that don't seem to have scientific support with the, those therapies. Talk about that a little bit, Jane. Well, I think when you when you get a diagnosis of cancer, you just you want a cure. I mean, and, and you're desperate. And so when you hear some of the, the the news about what the traditional methods, what the what our Western med medical uh, methods would be, it seems sort of discouraging. Then when you listen to these testimonials, and that's what they are. They're, I had a sister who did this, this, and this, and she was cured. Right. That's very, very. Powerful. Intoxicating. You yes. know, we want that information. And so we're really, really or we want that cure. Yeah. Is what we, want. we want to be that sister. And and I think that we're willing to take on and, and accept maybe something that's not scientific. And that's what you have to watch out for is that these are not double blinded studies, which is how we in, in Western medicine determine that a treatment is, is appropriate. Is we do studies where we take groups that got the treatment and then didn't get the treatment, nobody knew who got what, and we saw how they did. And that's how we do it, and that's, that's good science. But when you say, I have three people who did this, well, how many other people died? And they don't right. talk about that. So my, for us, I tell my patients, first of all, I make sure that we check with the medical oncologist and that those supplements are not interfering with their chemotherapy. But if they're okay, I say, as long as they don't break the bank, as long as they're using them as along with chemotherapy and it makes you feel better, you got a little bit more energy and, and, that, and, and the placebo effect can be tremendous and I'm okay with that as long as it doesn't hurt you and that you're not using it exclusively instead of our traditional medicine. Right. We have a whole department of holistic health and, and integrative medicine. We use acupuncture, aromatherapy, guided imagery, so we're really embracing 
other Eastern medicines and, and what they can do for a, a mind, body, and soul. And we're incorporating that into our regular Western medicine chemotherapy and putting them together. And I think we're really looking for that whole body improvement while people are being treated for their cancer. And I don't want to do one without the other. No, I, you know, when you have solid science that says this works, don't throw that away. Right. If you want to go these other ways, as long as it isn't breaking the bank, like you say, as long as it isn't a, a, a thousand gajillion dollars, the problem is there are people who know how desperate people with diagnosis are. And they're taking cancer, advantage of them. And they are liar, cheater, dirty, rotten pups. That's what snake they are. Snake oil salesmen. Say that three times fast. They are snake oil salesmen. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, it just burns my bottom that people who are at risk would be taken advantage of by yeah. these people. Uh, desperate people are taken advantage of. So I think you need to explore before you make the decision to go to Mexico, for example. I had dear friends who had a cancer, went to the Mayo Clinic, and he said, yeah, we, they gave us a 30% chance of any response. We went to Mexico, and he gave us a 70% chance. So, I mean, he said he was going to give us the same thing the man would give us, plus more, and gave us a 70% chance. And, of course, it was, you know, if the if the... If the if you're honest with the patient and, and you know the numbers, you say the numbers, but 30% is still not 0%. Right, right. They were, so, just, they were shopping for better numbers and, and then not going for the real science. Right. So one of the questions was birth control pills. Do they cause breast cancer? Is that a, a risk factor? No. So, <laughs> no. The answer um, is total, absolutely, very, no, very... No, because what they do is they regulate the hormones, so you're not doing this. So when you're taking birth control pills during your, your um, reproductive years, mm -hmm. your estrogen and, and progesterone levels are regulated. Right. Okay? So when we have women who are at risk and maybe have developed breast cancer earlier or younger, we may want to stop that. Two family um, members with breast cancer, for example. Well, but see, when we, when, when a woman gets to that age, I wouldn't, I, with two family members, I would not recommend she go on hormonal therapy. Yeah. That's not the same as birth control. That's so. There we go. That, so the there's hormonal, a difference between yep. hormone therapy and, and. But I talk to those women, and if they're really miserable, and their their hot flashes are so awful, and they can't think, and they really need that hormonal therapy to get through their day, we talk about the risks. We watch them closer. We say, okay, you got to live your life, yep. you know. And so, but but we're but we're educated and we're taking preventions and we're surveying them better. If a physician is not doing genetic sequencing for cancer, should you go to another physician? Also, have treatments results increase positive outcomes for ovarian cancer as well. Mm -hmm. So, and, and what Dr. Leland Jones was saying in that piece was... We've got 40 seconds, so we're going to... Okay, we're gonna was, yes, genomic sequencing is going to be the future. Everyone will be doing it. Not everyone is doing it today. There are very few in the country, but it's coming, and, and everybody will get genetic sequencing. Right. Genomic, sorry, yes, genomic. genomics. Mm -hmm. uh, is there an age a woman can reach when mammograms become unsafe? When they think they're going to die. Okay, so no, <laughs> your answer was no. I... I think that uh, we you certainly start at 50, maybe at 40 if there's a high risk. Mm -hmm. You and I disagree a little bit. Mm -hmm. And remember, we have after hours on Facebook. You can get the answers to the questions that we didn't get to. And now for the answer and winner of tonight's Prairie Doc quiz question. Choose the best answer. Breast cancer risk decreases in a woman who has had for her lifetime a sedentary history versus a regular running history. And the answer is? The runner, she the runner, wins. The, the runner wins. The answer is not surprisingly number two, being a regular runner. It was Joan Whittle from Watertown who answered the question correctly. Thank you, Joan, for participating and for watching. And a book will be in the mail to you soon. We'll be right back after this. Because they want you to be there for the many milestones yet to come. Because you don't want to miss out on the little things. There are many reasons to get life-saving cancer screenings. One in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer in her lifetime. But regular self-exams and mammograms can catch it early when it's most treatable. Promise. 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 Make the promise to get screened. Do it for the people you love. For more information about life-saving screenings or available financial assistance, visit GetScreenedSD.org. 
Healthcare science is advancing and improving, but with this comes change, especially with breast cancer. The female breast, not counting the skin cover, is made mostly of milk-making lobules, milk-carrying ducts, fat, connective tissue, blood vessels, and lymph nodes. The most common cancers start in the milk-carrying ducts, but cancer can start in any of the other types of tissue. Our best science suggests that a woman who is born this year will have a one in eight lifetime chance of developing breast cancer. That's up from one in 10 a decade ago. That's a change. Risk factors for breast cancer include increased age of the individual, inherited genetic alterations, high breast density on mammograms, a family history of breast cancer after 50 years of age, and a Caucasian ancestry. Also, risk is higher if there is a prior personal history of breast cancer, previous radiation treatment to the chest area, prior long history of excessive alcohol intake, menstruation before 12 or after 55 years of age, no babies or babies after 30 years of age, menopausal therapy with estrogen, and minimal physical activity in a lifetime. These are new and refined factors that indicate who has a higher risk of breast cancer. Despite these considerations, however, a woman without even one risk factor can still get breast cancer. Screening tests for breast cancer include history taking, physical exam, imaging, and genetic testing. Epidemiologists have found that not all breast cancer screening tests are helpful, however, and some can cause problems for the patient. Therefore, recommendations for breast cancer screening have changed. When a mammogram is false positive, suggesting there might be cancer when it's not there, this could cause undue stress, anxiety, and unnecessary biopsy. When a mammogram is false negative, suggesting there is no cancer, when it is there, this could cause delay of treatment, resulting in a greater chance for the cancer to spread. When a mammogram finds low-grade cancer that would never be life-threatening, this could cause unnecessary treatment and surgery that might worsen the patient's quality of life. For these reasons, recommendations for screening must be individualized. This confusing and changing information should help all of us realize that in this arena of healthcare, there are too many variables. Please discuss this with your doctor or care provider as it is her or his job to help you sort this out. Screening tests for breast cancer need to be tailored for every individual. With advancing science comes change. Well, it's a great big thank you to our guests. You're just fabulous. You have so much energy, and you love what you're doing, obviously. I do. I do. Thank I'm you very so lucky. Much. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank her. And she's volunteering to join us for the studio, so <laughs> we thank her for that. Well, it's time of the year again. The flu season is arriving. And getting your flu shot now will give you the best protection during the coming months. Science says it works. South Dakota usually has one of the highest vaccination rates. Let's keep that record going. And there is an event to recognize the fight against pancreatic cancer. It's at the 2017 Light the Capitol Purple Ceremony this Sunday, October 29th at 3 p.m. in the Capitol Rotunda at Pier. I'm going to give the talk there, and we would encourage anyone to attend, even if you want to hear me talk. <laughs> that does it for tonight from all of you, from all of us here at On Call with the Prairie Doc. Until next time, stay healthy. And remember, for questions, we get to go after hours. Go to Facebook. It is the seventh leading cause of death in the United States, affecting over 25% of those over 65. Diabetes. Next time, On Call with the Prairie Doc. Major funding for On Call with Prairie Doc has been provided by... Avera, 
is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call Television as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota, and with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions, Brookings Health System, Ophthalmology Limited, Avera Heart Hospital, Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Fishback Financial Corporation, Vance Thompson Vision, Aberdeen District Medical Society, Black Hills Medical Society, Third District Medical Society, Brookings, Madison and Flandreau, Dakota Bank, Orthopedic Institute, Physicians Care, Sanford Clinic Community Service Committee, and Swift Health Communications.